This CD contains a series of radio shows presented by Pastor Sheldon Emery. These programs were broadcast many years ago, so when you hear Pastor Emery mention books or packages available by mail, please understand that some of that material may no longer be available, and if you hear him give out a mailing address, it is incorrect. For a current catalog of literature and electronic media offered by America's Promise Ministries, please visit our website, where you will also find links to Pastor Dave Barley's YouTube video sermons and many other valuable resources. We invite you to explore www.amprom.org. That's A-M-P-R-O-M dot O-R-G. Thank you. What is God's purpose in the earth? We live in a time of great confusion philosophically and ideologically. Families, nations, and the world seem divided into many parts when it comes to any discussion or attempt at agreement as to the goals toward which we should strive. In this confusion, a small percentage of the earth's people stand out as claiming that whatever goals we might work toward in the future, they will come to naught unless they coincide with what God has planned and purpose for the earth. I happen to belong to that small minority. I believe that God's will is supreme in the earth, that God's purposes are those which will come to pass, that it is God's will which will be done. Now, you may or may not believe that, but almost all churchgoers do pray the Lord's Prayer once in a while, and they pray to God that, quote, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That is part of the prayer Jesus taught the disciples to pray, and it has been prayed millions of times in the last 2,000 years by professing Christians. Yet it seems that many Christian people not only do not realize what they are praying, but do not even know what God's will for the earth is. This series may seem a rather long way around in order to find what God's purpose and will are in the Bible, but I do not believe that Christian people will see God's promises and prophecies coming to pass unless they understand who the people are in whom these things will be brought to pass. And so we've been spending quite a lot of time in the book of Genesis on the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and then to Jacob, and showing the two manner of people who were born to Rebekah in her twin sons Esau and Jacob. Most Christians have some general knowledge that God chose Jacob and his twelve sons to become the progenitors of a race of chosen people, and that the Bible story is generally about the descendants of the twelve sons of Jacob Israel. But without some working knowledge of Esau the rejected brother of Jacob, and of the prophecies made about he and his descendants, we still cannot see the Bible story clear enough to relate it to past history, to the present, nor to the future. And that is our immediate study, the identifying characteristics and prophecies which will give us the identity of the people of Esau Edom in the world today. During the last several broadcasts, we have seen that the descendants of Esau, who is called Edom in Genesis 25 and Genesis 36, would hate and attempt to destroy the descendants of Jacob right up until the end of this age. Esau is called Edom in the Bible, and Edom means red. Many passages we have studied show us that the Edomites are synonymous with the red communists in the world today. They not only call themselves the Reds, but they are waging total warfare against Christ and Christendom. The war and conflict we see in the world today is between the descendants of Esau and, of necessity, the descendants of Jacob. The simplest way to understand current history and to find out what the outcome of this war will be is to find out from the Bible. And that is what we are doing. And as we do, we will find what God's purposes are in the earth. Last week I read in the book of Jasher how that Esau had killed Nimrod, the king of Babylon, and stolen some garments from him, 
garments which Jasher said had given Nimrod power to rule over Babylon. It was immediately after Esau obtained those garments that he sold the Abrahamic covenant birthright to Jacob. And I said, I believe that was because Esau now possessed something which he valued higher than God's word and God's covenant, the garments of Nimrod. I also said I would attempt to explain what those garments were and why wicked Esau prized them so highly. We'll get to that in just a moment, but first for my radio listeners, I want to make our free literature offer for the month of August for the last time. Write me at America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010, and ask for the August Literature Packet. That address is America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. I'll send you my booklet titled, Cinderella, A Bible Story. This explains how the author of that ancient so-called fairy tale hid in the characters and in the plot the story of the Bible. The prince, of course, is Jesus Christ. Cinderella, then, is the bride of Christ, and the other characters, such as the wicked stepmother, the stepsisters, the ball, the carriage, the beautiful gown, the search for Cinderella, the wedding feast, and so on, all have biblical counterparts. Cinderella, a Bible story, also identifies the protagonist in the modern battle between red communism and Christendom. This is the last time we'll offer the August packet, including our pamphlet, The Poisoned Needle. This has quite a number of quotes from medical sources as to the dangers to individuals from indiscriminate vaccinations and inoculations. You should read what some medical authorities of past years have to say about vaccinations. As I pointed out in a previous broadcast, recalling to mind the specter of the 1918 so-called flu epidemic to frighten our people into accepting the vaccine. But if some of you older folks will stir up your memories a little, you will recall that the highest rate of deaths from flu in 1918 was among young men in the prime of life, young soldiers in their teens and twenties who had been vaccinated for various diseases just before they became ill and died supposedly of the flu. About one-third of all who died in America from the 1918 flu were recently vaccinated young men. A statistic to think on before you rush out and get vaccinated in 1976, and a statistic which should prompt you to write me for our August packet containing the pamphlet, The Poison Needle. My address is America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. I could spend hours on that subject, but a word to the wise is sufficient. I should mention, though, something concerning the strange deaths of the legionnaires who attended the Philadelphia Conventions. Several people have come forward with information which they have given to the local news medium to pass on to the Philadelphia authorities. One man recalled a directive of many years ago while he was in the Air Force warning them to never use Teflon, that's T-E-F-L-O-N, Teflon-coated parts for ashtrays in airplanes. As anyone laying a cigarette on the Teflon and then picking up that same cigarette and smoking it would develop a flu-like fever, and if he were then treated with the common flu-fighting medicines, he would die. In the case of the legionnaires, of course, all were treated for flu, and about 15% of them have died. Another lady here in Phoenix who lived in England during World War II called the newspaper to say when she first heard that some said they remembered a musty odor at the Philadelphia Convention, she immediately thought of phosgene gas. 
apparently in her training in England, about possible saboteurs and gas attacks, they were told that phosgene gas, which has a musty smell, could be released from small containers into air ducts or in rooms, and listen to this, those breathing the phosgene gas develop symptoms similar to pneumonia and flu, including a very high fever. Medical treatment for flu or pneumonia, of course, will have no effect since the person is actually suffering from poison gas. If the dose is strong enough, of course, they then die in a few days. That information was on our local television news. It is this minister's conviction that those people at Philadelphia were poisoned, either accidentally or deliberately, and the authorities seem unwilling to even consider that possibility. In their strange desire to inject you all with some sort of a fluid, they keep saying disease instead of poison or murder. In the August packet, along with the booklet, Cinderella, A Bible Story, and the pamphlet, The Poison Needle, you will receive some tracts and articles, a list of our other books and tracts, a cassette tape catalog, and our current radio log. My address again, America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. Last call for the August packet. Back to the garments Esau stole from Nimrod. We shall see they are much more than just some sort of royal clothing. In the Old Testament, the English word garment is used many times, but only three times does it come from the Hebrew word adereth, spelled in English A-D-D-E-R-E-T-H. It is the feminine form of the Hebrew word adder, and its basic meaning is to expand, or something huge, or growing, or great and mighty. Strangely, or perhaps not so strangely, it is this Hebrew word adreth which is used to describe Esau when he was born. Genesis 25, verse 25. And the first came out red, all over like an hairy garment. And garment here is from the word adreth, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. So Esau began red. That is what it says, and like an hairy garment, and hairy adereth. The next place the word adereth is translated garment is in the book of Joshua. Israel had been brought out of Egypt. They had been given the law. Moses had died, and Joshua was now given the task by God of subduing the Canaanites and taking Canaan land for Israel. The city of Jericho was easily destroyed with God's help. And now they were going to conquer a little town called Ai. In verse 3, Joshua's military commanders said they would need only two or three thousand men, for Ai was small, so they went up against Ai. But, verse 5 says, The men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So here is victorious Israel, defeated and in fear and cowardice. Why? Well, you should read the whole chapter. But Joshua inquired of God and was told in verse 11, Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it, in other words, this accursed thing, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed thing from among you. What was this accursed thing they had taken among them which had removed God's protection from Israel and which God said they had to get rid of before he would be with them again? Well, it was a garment, 
or Adareth, the same word used to describe Esau when he was born. Let's read that passage. Joshua investigated and found the offending man, and then in verse 20 and 21, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils, and that would be the spoils of Jericho, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, Adareth, a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. The garment or the Adareth, the gold and the silver, were under his tent. And these things were so evil in God's sight that he had decreed in verse 15 that when this accursed thing was found, it was to be burnt with fire, and the man who hid it, and all of his family, and all of his possessions. Joshua, whose name means Jesus or salvation, carried out that sentence in verses 24 through verse 26. In verse 24, it says they brought Achan and all that he possessed, even his sons and daughters, to the valley of Achor. In verse 25, they killed them all and burnt everything pertaining to Achan. In verse 26, it says, And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger Therefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. The margin there says that Achor means trouble, the Valley of Trouble. Once the Adareth, the garment, was burned and removed from Israel, then Israel proceeded into the promised land with God's blessing. The last place in the Old Testament where the word garment appears, translated from Adareth, is in Zechariah 13, and that has more significance for our day. This chapter in its entirety is a prophecy of the cleansing of Israel at the end of this age and the establishment of Christ's rule over the earth. God says, among other things, of that day in verse 4, and this is Zechariah 13, And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment, adereth, a rough adereth, to deceive. So an adereth is something used to deceive people. If you have margin references there, you will find it is even more amazing, for they say that the word rough could have been translated hairy, H-A-I-R-Y, a hairy garment. And that was what we read of Esau's description when he was born. He came out red, all over like an hairy garment. So Adareth, in each case in which it is used, is connected either directly or indirectly with either Esau or Babylon or both, an hairy garment to deceive. This fits what we read in the book of Jasher about Esau's wickedness. In chapter 28 and verse 20 of Jasher, And Esau was a designing and deceitful man, and listen to this, one who hunted after the hearts of men and inveigled them. A marginal reference in Jasher says that the literal meaning of that Hebrew phrase is, quote, He stole their minds. He stole their minds. Esau, whose name was changed to Edom, which means red, deceived people and, in effect, took away from them the ability to think for themselves. That passage in Jasher comes after Esau killed Nimrod and stole Nimrod's garment, the garment which gave Nimrod power to rule over the Babylon of the Bible. So the garment was something which enabled Esau to deceive men and control their minds. That was the power Esau wanted more than he wanted God's covenant promises, the power to rule over men. The Bible says Esau was a hunter. 
It also says that Nimrod, founder of Babylon, was a hunter. What must they have hunted? Animals? No, they hunted men. Esau stole their minds. And what do the modern red communists do? They deceive people with such ingenious propaganda that the people actually act against their own best interests and eventually become the captives of the red communists. A perfect example, although an horrible one today, is the U.S. government's foreign policy called detente. Every American who is not under the mind control of the Reds knows that detente, the trading with Russia, and the selling of computers and grain, and disarming our own nation, is a sure way to become the captives of the Red Communists. Yet thousands of supposedly responsible men in high positions in our government continue to carry out just such a policy year after year. And millions of Americans, apparently, have been so deceived that they think the government is doing the right thing. Has something, has someone, quote, stolen their minds, unquote. After seeing that Esau's power was the same as that of Nimrod of Babylon, we can more easily see that the descendants of Esau Edom must be synonymous with the scarlet woman of Revelation 17 and 18, called there Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. In fact, the angel told John in Revelation 18 and verse 24, that it was by mystery Babylon sorceries that all nations were deceived. So end time Babylon deceives people and nations, just as Esau Edom did. Esau, whose name means red, and who stole the Adareth, or the means by which Nimrod ruled the Babylonian empire. Nimrod was cruel and wicked, yet he ruled multitudes. Red communism is cruel and wicked, Yet by an almost impossible work of deception, millions, hundreds of millions have fallen into their hands. A few million red communists in Russia control 200 millions in Russia and another 100 million in Europe. How do they do it? By the deceptive power of the garment or the adereth of Nimrod. Conquest and rule, not by overwhelming majority power, but by the deception and cunning of the descendants of Esau Edom. My time is up for today. Next week, God willing, I will show more of what Esau or Babylon's power is and how gold and silver, such as the gold and silver, Achan buried in the ground, are part of modern Red Babylon's power over the nations. Next week, we'll continue with our Bible story. And remember, if Pastor Emery is right, that red communism is red Edom, or mystery Babylon of the Bible, then the reds are not slated for victory, but are programmed by God Almighty for destruction. May God speed the day. Until next week when I return, God willing, this is Pastor Emery saying goodbye. God bless you. Read your Bibles and pray for Christian America. Last week I began the broadcast by stating that we live in a time of great confusion, and that that confusion extends from our own educational system to the churches and on into politics from the local level all the way to world affairs. Most people who make some effort to make sense out of what is going on around them do agree that confusion, rather than order, seems to be increasing. Well, that is understandable because the Bible calls the end-time world system by the name of Babylon, and the word Babylon means confusion. In Genesis 10, we read that Nimrod founded Babel, and the margin tells us that means Babylon, and then in Genesis 11 is the story of the building of the tower that God eventually destroyed. It is also called a city, and in verse 9, after its destruction, the Bible says, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. The margin reference there says that the Hebrew word Babel is the same as Babylon and means confusion. 
We still use the phrase in relation to hearing many voices without being able to understand what the voices are saying. We say, oh, all I could hear was a babble of tongues. So, many words without understanding is Babylon. Just as our present-day politics, education, and religion are mostly Babylon confusion. On every subject, we are told so many confusing things that the people themselves often give up on understanding. And that is what the enemies of God's people want for us to give up and let them run things. The one thing that will keep our people from giving up is a clear understanding of just what is happening and what is going to happen, and the only source for that is in Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy gives God's people a preview, pre-knowledge of future events. At the same time, it gives us a knowledge of the meaning of present events. In any case, it gives us hope For Bible prophecy, although it has much to say about the time when the enemies of God's people would be triumphant, Bible prophecy ends in their destruction and the saving of the people of God. God's prophecies are also given only for the wise. For as we read, the angel declared of Daniel's prophecies in Daniel 12.10, None of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand. I have been attempting to show you that Bible prophecy connects the descendants of Esau with end-time Babylon. The book of Jasher says Esau was a wicked and deceitful man, while his brother Jacob Israel was honorable and followed God's word. Esau is Edom, which means red, according to Genesis 25 and Genesis 36, And in actuality, the descendants of Esau-Edom are the reds of our day. They are the red enemies of the followers of Jesus Christ, red communism versus Christianity, if you please. Last week we read about end-time Babylon, or red communism, in Revelation 18 and verse 23, that all nations were deceived by her sorceries. We know that continually giving individuals or groups of people false and confusing information will bring them into a state of helplessness and deception. At the end of the age, this mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, would have deceived all nations or all peoples by her deliberate confusion. Jeremiah was given to write a lengthy prophecy about end-time Babylon, in chapters 49, 50, and 51. In Jeremiah 51, as he prophesies the end-time destruction of this great red power, we read this in verse 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. The Hebrew word translated mad there means insane or literally out of their mind. This would fit the word in Revelation 18.24 that they are deceived. Revelation 18 also mentions the wine of Babylon. Verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And in Revelation 18 and verse 17, the angel told John that that woman clothed in red, mystery Babylon, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Yes, her rule over all nations is by deception, a word which exactly fits the method of red communist control which we now see ruling or controlling much of the earth's people. Eventually, according to Bible prophecy, it would come to pass that almost all of the people alive on the earth would be deceived or have their minds controlled by red mystery Babylon, this end-time world power under Esau Edom. That is, all of the people would be deceived except those whose minds had been enlightened by the word of God. Jesus spoke of this time with some solemn warnings. Most of you are quite familiar with them in Matthew 24. A time of war and rumors of wars, kingdoms rising against kingdom, famines, pestilences, 
earthquakes in diverse places. Even verse 21, which seems most frightening. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, known or ever shall be. Some ministers call this the great tribulation. And that is not an incorrect term, since Jesus seems to plainly say that it would be worse than anything that had gone before since the world began, and that it would be worse than anything that would follow it. So it could correctly be called the Great Tribulation. But these words of Jesus are then used by the Antichrist to bring confusion or to bring Babel into their teaching by saying that, oh, this time is only going to happen to the Jews and the non-Christians. The great tribulation won't happen to you Christians because you are all going to be gone off in a rapture to heaven before this great tribulation comes to pass, and on and on. But if one will study all of Jesus' words in Matthew 24, one can easily see Jesus was talking about something that would come upon those who followed him. In the very next verse, Jesus says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. If the tribulation spoken of in verse 21 comes only on Jews and non-Christians, why would God have to shorten the tribulation to save the elect? And there is more. Verse 23 and 24. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. When would these false Christs and false prophets arise, and almost deceive the very elect? Well, obviously during the time of tribulation spoken of in verse 21. Again, if the elect, if the Christian believers, are all gone off to heaven in a so-called rapture before this tribulation, why would Jesus warn them about the deception during this time? No, it is very plain that the Christian believers would be on the earth during that tribulation, and it was deception more than war, famine, and pestilence, about which Jesus was giving warning. In fact, it was deception of which Jesus warned of first when he began this long answer to the disciples' question in Matthew 24. He begins in verse 4, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In other words, Many would come in Jesus' name and would preach that Jesus is the Christ and would deceive many. Verse 23 and 24 make it plain. The time of that deception by men purporting to be preaching Jesus would be during the tribulation period. I've heard some rapture preachers go so far as to say that all Christians and all mention of Christ will be gone from the earth during this tribulation. But that is not what Jesus said. So, not only is Mystery Babylon the deceiver of all nations in a great time of tribulation, but here is Jesus' own words that men preaching about Christ will have a major part in the deception of the elect during that time. I believe we are already in that time of tribulation. I don't know what some ministers think the murder of millions of Christian believers by pagan Rome was. I don't know what they think the murder of more millions on orders of the Roman popes was. And I don't know what they think the murder of scores of millions of Christians under red communism is. But I think it is tribulation. And I think it is the great tribulation spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 24. In just a moment, I am going to offer our free literature packet for the month of September, and one booklet in that packet shows in some detail that the so-called pre-tribulation rapture teaching is not only false, but is one of the deceptions being practiced upon the elect of Christ. 
And I'll give you the address where you can write for your free copy. So we find in our study that Esau Edom hated Jacob Israel and tried to kill him, and that Esau Edom was a wicked and deceitful man, just as present-day communists hate God's Christian Israel and try to kill them, and do it with wickedness and deceitfulness. Deception is the communist's major weapon, and once they gain territorial control over any large number of people, then they set about to kill all who believe in Jesus Christ and the Bible. In Revelation 17, Red Babylon killed so many believers that John writes in verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Some so-called rapture preachers like to say all of these last chapters of the book of Revelation are about the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation, and they will not happen till the Christians are gone. But they usually do not read verse 6 of Revelation 17, where the red beast, or Babylon, is drunken with the blood of the saints. The mass murder by red communism of unknown millions of Christian people in the last 60 years has made something or someone drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian defector, spoke to the AFL-CIO convention in Washington, D.C. on June 30, 1975. The American newspapers and the American television have reported little of what he said, but I have a copy of his entire speech. Among other things, he gave a comparison of the numbers of Russian citizens killed by their own government in Russia before and after the communist conquest. Here is the direct quote from Solzhenitsyn's speech, a quote which, as far as I know, appeared in no American newspaper. Quote, In accordance with the calculations of the specialists of the most precise, most objective statistics, in the pre-revolutionary Russia, During the 80 years before the Communist Revolution, when there were attempts on the Tsar's life and assassination of a Tsar, revolution, and so on, during these years only about 17 persons a year were executed. In my book, I cite a book published by the Cheka, and I should insert the Cheka is the Russian secret police of the early 20s. I cite the book which was published by the Cheka in 1920. In 1918 and 1919, they, the Communist Secret Police, give a proud report of their revolutionary activities, and they apologize that their data was not quite full, but in 1918 and 1919, the Cheka had executed without trial more than 1,000 persons a month. This is written by the Cheka itself, before they understood how it was going to look in history. Still quoting from Solzhenitsyn, At the height of Stalin's terror in 1937 and 38, if we divide the number of persons executed by the number of months, we get more than 40,000 persons executed per month. End of quote. Under the Russian Tsars, the government executed an average of 17 of its own citizens every year. And remember, at that time, all governments were executing murderers, rapists, and traitors. Under Stalin, the Red Communists executed a half a million of its own citizens in a year's time. The mind boggles at the enormity of the blood and murder under Red Communism. I read those figures for two reasons. Number one, to demonstrate that the murder of their own citizens by communist governments is so great as to stagger the imagination. And number two, to show that in spite of the truth that red communism is carrying out a program of murder and wickedness that far surpasses anything of past history, millions of people in America have had their minds conditioned to think of the pre-communist government of Russia as wicked and oppressive, and that the people under communist rule are better off than they were under the czars. What happened to our people? 
has someone done to them what we read in the book of Jasher that Esau Edom did, that he, quote, stole men's minds. Esau Edom, once he obtained the garment or the adereth of the king of Babylon, was able to control men by controlling their minds. That is what the Bible says in time red Babylon will do, deceive all nations and all people. Solzhenitsyn tells us in his book, The Gulag Archipelago, that the terror, the murder, and the slave camps are still in Red Russia today. There has been no change. Except now, of course, the same system of end-time Red Babylon has reached into about one half of the rest of the world also. Just as Esau Edom's hatred and war against Jacob Israel never ended, neither has the satanic drive of the Red Communist to destroy all Christians and Christianity changed. I have more to read in the Bible about this deception at the end of the age, but here is our free literature for September. Write to me at America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. Ask for the September packet. First, it will include one of my books on prophecy with a rather long title, The Bible Says Russia Will Invade America and Be Destroyed. In that book, I cover many prophecies from the Bible which fit what some Americans are slowly beginning to see, that the Red Communists have no intention of making peace or carrying on friendly relations with America for any length of time that they are preparing to destroy America if they can. This is all prophesied in the Bible. It is quite easy to see once one has the key, the key being the way of identifying the modern nations in Bible prophecy. And that is shown in my book, The Bible Says Russia Will Invade America and Be Destroyed. We'll also send you a rather startling article from another source, which has recently come into our hands, an article about the preparations now being made by the Red Communists to explode atomic and hydrogen bombs on America in the future. While our politicians speak of peace, trade, and detente, the Red Communists have detailed plans for war already laid out. And some of you folks who have been taught that the Bible says that Red Russia is going to attack and invade Palestine, you write for this September packet. The Reds have 7,000 missiles aimed at Western Europe and America. None are aimed at Palestine. Some of you should begin to wonder about a clergy which keeps telling you that there is nothing in the Bible about any war between Red Russia and Christian America. God told us in Isaiah that he wrote the end from the beginning, God must know about the Red Communist plan for war against America. The September packet includes some other things of interest relating to Bible prophecy and to this ministry. My address for that free September packet is America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. That's America's Promise, Box 5334, 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, and the zip code is 85010. And we'll give that address again at the end of the program. Now in the minutes remaining, turn with me again to the Bible about this end-time deception. Last week we read the passage in Zechariah 13 and verse 4, of the end of the age, and it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. We saw last week that the words rough garment are related both to Esau, Edom, and to Babylon. Garment there is the same Hebrew word for the name of what Esau stole from the king of Babylon, which gave the king power to rule over the people. 
And both words are used to describe Esau. In the account of his birth in Genesis 25, he came out red all over like an hairy or rough garment. This prophecy in Zechariah must mean that the prophets in the end of the age, and that word prophets means those who claim to come in the name of and for God, we call them ministers or preachers today, the prophets would come with this garment of Babylon to deceive the people. In other words, they would be using the same methods of deception which Nimrod, king of Babylon, used, which gave him power to rule over the people. To deceive people, you must tell them falsehoods. But they must be told in such a way that the people believe the falsehoods to be true. Otherwise, it would not deceive them. And the falsehood must then convince them to act in such a way that they come under the control of those who wish to rule over them. Jesus warned of that deception in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13, which we have already read. Paul spoke of those who taught false doctrine in Romans 16 and said they, quote, by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Notice, it is not by bad words, but by good words they deceive. They don't deceive by threatening you and accusing you. They deceive by good words. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said that the ministers of Satan would actually come to us as, quote, apostles of Christ, verse 13. You should read all of that chapter. He said this in relation to his warning in the first verses of that chapter, that some would come with another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. In other words, by what they said and the words they used, they would preach Jesus, they would claim to have his spirit, and preach his gospel, but what they actually preached would be a different gospel, a different Jesus, a different spirit. In fact, it would be the gospel that would further the cause of Satan himself, or of Red Babylon. In Ephesians 4, Paul is telling the Christians that the preaching of the word is to edify and instruct the church, and adds this in verse 14, "...that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This warning tells us that men deliberately lie in wait to deceive Christians with cunning and craftiness, and they do it with false doctrine. In Second Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy both that Christians will be persecuted and that evil men will use deception against them. Putting this all together, it is obvious that the Bible gives us abundant warning that Christians will be persecuted and will be put to death by the enemies of God during this age, and that the wicked ones will use lies and deceptions to get the Christians under their control. But God knows the end from the beginning, and the end of the wicked red rule over God's people is foretold in the Bible. Until next week when I return, God willing, this is Pastor Emery saying goodbye, God bless you, read your Bibles, and pray for Christian America. Yes, this is Pastor Emery with another portion of our radio Bible study, What is God's Purpose in the Earth? In the last five or six broadcasts, in our study of Esau Edom, or the modern Red Communists, it may seem to new listeners that God either has no good purpose in the earth, or at least his purpose is being thwarted or sidetracked by the enemies of Christ and of Christendom. That may appear to be what is happening, but as one becomes familiar with Bible prophecy, one sees that events are working out in the world just exactly as foretold in God's Word. And when one sees that this is so, then one can believe that God's final good purpose for the earth will also come to pass. The Holy Ghost gave Peter to write in 2 Peter 3 and verse 7 
But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That word perdition is the same Greek word translated destruction in other places, against the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Paul wrote the same thing in his second letter to the Thessalonians. He speaks of the return of Jesus Christ in verse 8 and 9, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. In the book of Revelation, John saw a vision of the wicked of the earth slain in such numbers that he ends with these words, And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Revelation 19 and verse 21. Jeremiah wrote of this day of destruction, And the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. And on and on, scores and scores of passages in the Bible of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, when he will rise to shake terribly the earth and destroy the wicked. Paul describes this last shaking of the earth by God in the twelfth chapter of Hebrews, and in verse 27, he writes that the shaking is, quote, the removing of things that may be shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And then he concludes, Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. What will be the end of this age? Well, the shaking and the destruction of all that is wicked and anti-God, so that it will be removed and will leave remaining on the earth only the kingdom for Christ's rule. And so, all of Pastor Emery's listeners breathed a sigh of relief and said, Oh, that is good to know. I was getting worried. I was afraid the Edomite Reds were going to win. Now I can relax and just wait for God to take care of them. But you cannot relax, for if you are a Christian, you are called to be in the army of Christ, the army which will be used to destroy Red Edomite communism. We have seen that Esau Edom, the ancient enemy of God's people Israel, is synonymous with end-time prophetic Babylon. And in Revelation 18 and verse 4, God's people are told to do this to mystery Babylon the Great. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. That doesn't sound like a call to pacifism in the last battle. In the next chapter, those who will be with Christ in that battle to destroy the wicked are called an army. Verse 19, Of whom would that army be composed if it were not the Christians? In Jeremiah 51, where God prophesies the end of this end-time Babylon which rules over the whole earth, God speaks to His people this way. Jeremiah 51 and verse 20, Thou art my battle-axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. In Hebrews 11, Paul commends the faith of the saints who had gone on before in phrases such as this. Verse 33, Who through faith subdued kingdoms. Verse 34, Waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Christian pacifism? Christian tolerance of heathen enemies? Nonsense. You won't find it in the Bible. The prophet Joel gave quite a detailed description of the events of the end of this age. In fact, the first nine verses of Joel 2 are easily recognized as a description of red communism's conquest of the earth. Then in the next verses, as God foretells communism's destruction and the deliverance of His people... We read this in verse 11. This is Joel 2. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? 
Daniel writes of this time in chapter 11 and says in verse 32, But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. These and many other passages show God's people as the soldiers in the battle against the Antichrist who would conquer the earth in the last days. Those who believe in Jesus Christ were not to be pacifists or neutrals in this battle, or to cooperate with the enemy. And yet millions of them disclaim any participation in the battle against Red Edom, against Red Mystery Babylon, against Red World Communism, because they say, oh, we're supposed to love and tolerate everyone, and anyway, we are all going to be raptured off the earth before that battle is begun. I'm sorry, my friends, the battle is already joined. The tribulation is already here. The Antichrists already rule over the kings of the earth, and many of you are either draft dodgers or deserters from the armies of the Lord of hosts. But some of you do want to do your duty, to answer the trumpet call of God, to be good soldiers in the armies of Christ. But you say, I don't know what to do. I don't even know how to recognize the enemy. And how can I fight in this battle unless I know who I am supposed to oppose? Pastor Emery, you tell me the enemies of Christ are the Esau Edomites or the Reds, but how can I know who they are in my country today? Well, I realize Americans need answers. Most Americans are like the colorblind college student who volunteered to play on the rugby team his first day in college. He not only did not know how the game was played, but he could not even recognize who was on his side and who were the opponents. In addition, most Americans wanted to be spectators anyway, not participants, but they are now finding out they are in the game. But they cannot tell who is on whose side, because both the enemies of Christ and the believers in Christ look and dress and talk so much alike you can't tell the difference. You have been a spectator. Now you must be a soldier, and newly drafted soldiers must have instruction. Otherwise, they could do more damage and hurt to their own side than they might do to the enemy. And the instruction book for the armies of the host of the Lord is the Bible. In the next several broadcasts, I am going to turn to one chapter in the Old Testament, and we will study that one chapter verse by verse. When we get through with it, you will be able to recognize Esau Edomites in America. You will be able to tell them from the rest of the population. How about that? Does it sound possible? Well, you stick with me for the next couple of weeks, and we will see. I'll be laying some groundwork today, some preliminaries as it were, to establish the principle upon which we will study that one chapter and relate it to the present time. So you get your Bibles and follow with me today to study the principle, and then we will get to that specific chapter next week, God willing. First I will offer our free packet of literature for radio listeners, which you can obtain by writing to me at America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. This literature packet has information which you need to understand the great and terrible day of the Lord, the day of the last battle. One booklet in the packet is mine, entitled, The Bible Says Russia Will Invade America and Be Destroyed. In it, I identify America in Bible prophecy, so you will know America's place in this last battle, and I show the prophecies which tell us that red communists from Russia will invade this nation. It also shows the reason for the battle and its outcome. The title, The Bible Says Russia Will Invade America and Be Destroyed. The packet also includes a rather lengthy report on the current red communist plans for an atomic and hydrogen war against America, a war in which they hope to destroy Christianity in this nation, then take over the nation and set up a new red communist dictatorship over the survivors. Their plans fit what the Bible says they would attempt to do against this last stronghold of Christianity, America. 
Now, some of you think that the communists plan to take over America peacefully by subversion and treason, but atomic war is in their plans. We'll also send a copy of our last monthly bulletin telling of other things of interest going on in the nation, according to the Bible, and a few other items for you to read. All of this is free and postpaid to radio listeners who write to me at America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. Ask for the September packet. That address again, America's Promise, Box 5334, that's 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, and the zip code is 85010. And I would appreciate it very much if you would tell me over what station you hear this broadcast. It will help us use your tithes and offerings wisely where they do the most good. All right, turn to Matthew 13, and we will use some of Jesus Christ's teachings regarding the enemies of God to establish the principle upon which we will study that one chapter in the Old Testament next week. Jesus told a parable to his disciples in Matthew 13. Most of you know it quite well. It is called the parable of the tares and the wheat. Jesus said they would both grow in the kingdom, and he identified the wheat as the children of the Son of Man, and the tares as the children of the devil or of the wicked one. Verse 37 and 38. When the servants asked if they should gather up the tares, he said in verse 29, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. In other words, they were so alike and intertwined and living in the same area that the tares, the children of the devil, could not be removed without danger of damage to the children of the Son of Man. And he didn't want that. So he continued in verse 30, Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest... I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So the tares and the wheat would be very similar in appearance. So similar it would be dangerous to try and separate them during the growing season. But harvest time was a different matter. Then there would be an order from God Almighty, from Jesus Christ, for the gathering out of the tares. Now, you farmers probably understand this better than city folks. If you know what a tear is, it is really a weed, but it looks so much like wheat while it is growing that you cannot tell the difference. But as both the tares and the wheat get ripe unto harvest, there is a change. The wheat is heavy with fruit, and the heads bend over from the weight. The tear fruit is mostly air or wind, and the head stands straight up out of the field and can easily be seen and recognized. In verse 38, Jesus said, This would take place in the world or here on the earth, so it is a kingdom parable, so the tares would be gathered out of the world. This is the cleansing of the earth in preparation for the kingdom. From this, we know two important things. Number one, Christian Israel, or the children of the Son of Man, are not going to be gathered first, as the rapture people tell us. The wicked will be gathered first. And number two, when it comes time for the gathering of the wicked out of the earth, they will be easy to recognize, so that they can be gathered without any danger or damage to the children of the kingdom. I believe we are reaching that harvest time when the children of the wicked one, or the tares, can begin to be recognized. In other words, we can now learn how to tell the difference between the tares and the wheat, between the children of Red Edom and the children of Jacob Israel, as we shall see when we get into that chapter in the Old Testament next week. We also have Jesus' words of infinite wisdom in Matthew 7, near the end of his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, Jesus is instructing the disciples, starting in verse 15, Beware of false prophets 
which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So here again, Jesus is telling a story where there will be two kinds of people. They will both look like sheep. But one will not be a sheep, but will be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they will be different, but outwardly, they will appear to be the same thing. So how do you tell they are wolves and not sheep? The next phrase explains, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Ye shall know them by their fruits. And that is the key, or the principle, we will use to unlock the present-day identity of the children of Edom, or Red Esau, as they intermingle with the Christians or the children of God. We will be able to recognize them by their fruits. Now Jesus adds more here, which is important. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? The answer obviously is no. You cannot get one kind of fruit from another kind of plant. Jesus goes on, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. In the Bible, in a number of places, God uses plants or trees to stand for people. Israel is called an olive tree. The enemies of Israel are often referred to as thorns or briars or thistles. In Ezekiel 31, we have a parable about Egypt, Assyria, and Israel, part of which reads, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. And then he goes on to show the destruction of that cedar or tree, meaning not for us, but actually a certain kind of people. Anyway, Jesus is here using the plants to demonstrate that certain fruit must be expected from certain kind of men and certain fruit from others, good fruit from a good people and evil fruit from an evil people, and that it will not be otherwise. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And then to be sure his disciples understood he was instructing them on how to tell the sheep from the wolves in sheep's clothing, he repeats again, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So I say this, if we could find out what kind of fruit to expect to come from the tree of red Edom, we could look for that fruit, and the people who produce that kind of fruit must be the descendants of the Edomites, even if they insisted they were some other people, or even if we had never heard the name Esau-Edom associated with any people, we could see through their masquerade and know their identity as Edom. If Jesus is telling us the truth, that one can tell a wolf in sheep's clothing from a sheep by observable fruit, so we should be able to discover Edom by his fruit. Next week, God willing, in one chapter in the Old Testament, we will find an amazing and complete list of the fruit of Edom. Like the colorblind man who could not see the color of the uniforms and couldn't tell who was on his side and who his opponents were, if he had watched the game for a little while to see who was doing what, he would soon have found who was helping him and who was opposing him. He would have been able to recognize his enemy by their fruits. By their fruits he would have known them. And so we will read God's rule book, the Bible, and see what it says the Esau Edomites do. We can then identify them by their doings, by their fruits. We shall do that next broadcast, God willing. I don't want to start on that today in the little time remaining, and this will give you all fair warning to set your alarm or mark your calendar and arrange your household chores or work so you can study that one chapter in the Old Testament 
which will identify Esau Edom among us today in current world history. This will do this as no other source of information can do. God's word is our wisdom. Let us use it in the great battle in which the soldiers of Jesus Christ are involved. Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6.13, That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. He then lists the different parts of the armor, all of which are defensive for our protection except the last part. Verse 17, And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is our weapon, our sword. And next week we shall see how simply and certainly it identifies the wolves in sheep's clothing among us. So have your Bible ready and read with me. In that one chapter, you will learn more about the enemies of America and the red enemies of Christendom than you can learn from all the anti-communist preachers and organizations which exist in America. God's Word is a light in a dark place, and America in her darkness needs that light. Our local Phoenix newspaper had a very long article about the so-called swine's flu. It gave the background of its supposed discovery by a doctor at Fort Dix, New Jersey, among the soldiers. The article is too long to quote on the radio, but the gist of it is this. Only one person has died of that so-called swine flu. Let me repeat that. Only one person has died of that certain type of flu. He was a young soldier who, after getting this so-called flu, went on a forced march while he had a temperature of between 102 and 104 degrees. He died upon return from that march, probably from exhaustion, because he was forced to march while ill, instead of from any sort of flu. In the article, it also tells us that since that time, no one, repeat, no one in America has found another person with that so-called swine flu virus. The doctor at Fort Dix is quoted in the article as saying, it is just as if it never existed before and now does not exist again. Since autopsies usually prove that about one half of all doctors' diagnoses are wrong, there is a 50% chance that that soldier never had such a thing as swine's flu in the first place, and that he died of overexertion while suffering from a high temperature which could have been caused by a score of...